Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Weiss, Director of Education and Events for AGRIP. Thank you for joining us today for a webinar that explores how to identify the true cost of technology systems. In today's program, we will understand how technology investments can support operations and member relations. We'll review how a pool used waste walks to identify the cost of staff time in a legacy system. We'll get an introduction to the concept of process mapping and how process mapping supports identifying a pool's system requirements for an RFP, as well as how this can create shared language for pool staff and a governing body and how this is fundamental to strategic decision making. Today's session is going to be led by Wendy Parker, who is Executive Director of Health Trust in New Hampshire. Wendy is responsible for the overall management and strategic planning for the organization which provides medical, prescription drug, dental, life, and long and short-term disability coverage to local government entities serving more than 71,000 enrollees, dependents, and retirees. Our second presenter, Philip Seawright, comes to us from Tricor. Philip is a subject matter expert in several technology strategy disciplines, including IT business relationship management, program management governance, agile software delivery, and ITIL and IT service management. Philip spent 15 years in Silicon Valley, where he worked inside large enterprises, where he also provided strategic technology advisory services to organizations nationwide to help modernize IT processes, adjust technology, organization, and spending priorities, and improved engagement between IT organizations and their business <clears throat> counterparts. Now, before I turn it over to Wendy and Philip, I want to share just a few house cleaning notes. First, you can adjust the webinar volume on your own computer so it is at a level comfortable to you. If you're calling in by phone, Turn off nearby wireless devices. This will help with your individual internet connection. If you have any sound troubles, consider switching between phone and computer sound using the GoToMeeting controls. All attendees are automatically on mute. So if you want to ask a question, type it into the question field on your webinar control panel. We'll address your questions as we go or at the end, depending on the questions themselves. There is a handout available. To access it, use the handouts pane in the webinar control panel and click the name of the file. It'll automatically begin downloading and you can save the file to your computer. And we are recording this webinar to make it available to you and your colleagues on demand and we'll get it posted to the AGRIP website in the coming week or so. Now I'd like to turn it over to Wendy. Wendy? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a, a wonderful weather day as we are in New Hampshire. It certainly is nice out today. As we begin the presentation, before we jumped into our technology roadmap, we thought it would be helpful to just spend a couple of minutes talking about who Health Trust is and put some context around our story. So let me begin with a description of what Health Trust is. We're a self-insured public risk pool located in New Hampshire. We provide employee benefit coverage to New Hampshire municipalities, schools, and a whole host of other quasi-municipal entities such as water districts, regional planning associations. We've been serving members since 1984. We're governed by a board of directors. Um, there are 11 who represent the membership. Some are elected officials, some are appointed officials, such as HR directors, business administrators, town managers, and school superintendents. And we have three employee representatives. We currently have a firefighter, a teacher, and a general employee. So we are a little unique from some of our other municipal-based pools where we combine both county, school, and municipal all into one. We certainly have a wide range of members. We cover about 350 member groups. We have two renewals, both January and July. And our group size varies significantly. We have groups of one and groups over a thousand. And we provide the rating for about what I consider 80 rating units. We do rate all of our small groups together and then our large groups are individually, individually rated. As Stephanie mentioned, we cover about 36,000 unique employees and retirees. And then if you include their dependents, we're a little over 71,000. 
How we interface with our members has been changing over time. And I think that's something that Philip in his talk will spend a lot of time talking about. And we've been doing that through traditional on-site visits, through the phone, through our web. And now we're about to launch this month some new web-enabled technology for smartphones because we all know everyone is carrying those with them. As far as employees, we do this with about 62 employees total. We have about 15 member facing staff. They range from wellness advisors to benefit advisors, member relations staff. But most importantly, and what we're going to talk about today is we have two teams that focus on infrastructure and security and reporting and data. And on those teams, we have three business analyst positions as well as two in-house developers. We do most of our work here internally as far as setting rates, billing, all the administration, but we do utilize several vendors for their networks and claims administration. Those include Caremark, Anthem, Northeast Delta Dental, as far as our core coverages, and then we do fully ensure things like life and long-term disability. Member support we've been doing for some time, and I think this is a, a value-added proposition for us. We do a lot of on-site benefit training. We do a lot of retiree workshops, retiree services, and we have a significant wellness program that we invest about $5 million a year that provides a multitude of ways that our covered employees can get incentives for wellness activities. We provide a standard employee assistance program. And then some of our signature programs right now are our Smart Shopper, which we provide incentives for employees that are willing to go to high quality, low cost providers. And those incentives range from $25 for something like lab work up to over $500 for things like infusion therapy. We also have gotten um, started to offer telemedicine. We have a live health online option um, that we have seen pretty good participation in so far. As far as member service, this is where our complexity starts. So we do a lot of COBRA administration, retiree administration, both for, with the New Hampshire retirement system, but as well as individual billing for retirees as well. And we provide a lot of ACA support um, and other things to go along with that. Our core platforms and where we're going to spend the heart of this discussion today is a really interesting journey for us. So we have three core systems that we utilize. And then as we learned, we have been very good over time about meeting member needs, but we've done that through adding lots of customization to our systems. And you're gonna see some of those charts later in the presentation. And quite frankly, when we went through this process, I was surprised at how much customization and add-ons that we had have. And when we're dealing with our carriers and internally within our organization, we have almost 40 integrations with data points going in and out of our carriers and within our system. And currently we have two data centers and we've been spending a lot of, lot of time on business continuity development and making sure that we have replication within our system. So that's a little bit about us. We're next gonna flip over to our roadmap. And so, as many of you might have heard me talk about when I talked about this topic in March, HealthTrust started on its currently te current technology journey back in 2008 when I attended an AGRIP conference in San Diego that was titled, Bring in the Bots, Technology Opportunity for Pools. Some of the words in the session overview caught my attention, robotic processing, chatbots, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. It sounded interesting, wasn't sure it necessarily applied to us, um, but thought I'd give the session a try. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong about the applicability. And thanks to that presentation and getting exposure to Philip's company and his guidance relative to the possibilities of evolving technologies, the last year and a half has been an eye-opening process that has set our, our pool on a path of creating and implementing a roadmap that is based on a shared vision, both with staff and with the board. So you may ask, why take this journey? What's in it for us? Well, the expectations of both members and covered employees are changing, and we need to make sure that we are at least caught up, if not ahead, for long-term viability. For example, you can shop for everything online now and get it in two days. So why does the traditional model of getting your ID cards seven to 10 days after you, you enroll, okay? 
You play all your bills online, so why is the pool still sending invoices and expecting payment by mail? These are all areas that we talked about as we walked through this journey. So as our story began a year and a half ago, we were prompted to take this new path. To kick it off, we did two important things. First, we hired a highly talented, disruptive data and reporting manager, which was one of the best decisions our organization has made. With his relevant external experience in coverage areas, he really was able to take our organization and kick off a digital maturity assessment that has led us along this path. What was also important for us as we went through this process was to involve all levels of the staff and the board. And in order to involve the board, one of the primary things we did was we shared with the board some knowledge of peer groups like ours, such as the Association of Washington Cities, who is going through a similar process. Hearing peer to peer, board to board, that this was important and what they were finding out through their process helped us get the support that we needed to move forward. And that support was a commitment of an additional business analyst in order to do what's called map, map our systems. And you're gonna see those examples as we go through the presentation today. I cannot stress enough as an organization how eye-opening and how important this process is. And we're gonna see actually some of our process maps. This was probably got the staff on our team the most excited going through the process and has helped propel us forward as we go through on our journey. So mapping the systems consists of a whole bunch of things, but it's really sitting down with paper and pen or technology tools as Philip would like to get us to use. But we, if you walked around our building right now, you would see a lot of paper on the walls with these processes as well. And really identifying how many people and systems touch a process that you take for granted as you go through. And so we spent several months mapping over, I think it was 100 processes to get to this point. That then allowed us to bring in vendors to do a vendor showcase. And why the system mapping was important before you bring those vendors in was to make sure that you're asking the right questions and the right touch points as you have those vendors in. And so that combination of the map, pro, mapping our processes and the vendor showcase allowed us to get to a point where we could issue an RFP, which we did in June of this year, for a new core system that brings all of our um, disparate systems together and hopefully will allow us to be much more efficient and nimble in making changes going forward. So right now we have issued that RFP, we have the responses back, and in October we're going through our due diligence, that's on-site demos, which again, that system mapping has allowed us to put specific scenarios together about how we want to see how these potential new systems operate and where we potentially, and this has been a huge conversation on our team, how we have to look at the world differently. If we hadn't gone through this process, RFP would have said, here, here's what we, here's what we do today. How can you duplicate that? Instead, we are asking, we, these are the things we need to accomplish. How can you help us do that in the most efficient, user-friendly manner possible? And so we're going through that process. After October with those um, processes, we will then be ready in December to go to our committee and recommend a new system for our organization that will hopefully add lots of new functionality to our processes. In addition, when I say functionality, it may be not be that you're actually looking for new services or new ways to do things, but I think it's redeploying your staff to do those things that really are of value to the members. And that's probably been our biggest learning curve through this process. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Philip, who's gonna take what I've shared on a high level and really turn it into the core concepts and procedures that I believe are important as many of you contemplate going on this journey. Thank you, Wendy. Philip? So Yes, thank you. One of the key takeaways that we'd like you to have is anytime there's a new wave of technology, it will typically change your processes. So in the past, we've heard several of our clients say you shouldn't automate a bad process, but kind of walk, want to walk you back through why that's the case. And I was first taught this concept about 15 years ago, and someone said, you have this concept of paying your employees. And uh, over time, if you go back over a thousand years, we would barter 
to pay our employees. And then we had coinage. And ultimately from coinage, we moved to paper. And there was a technology wave with each one of these. And then we had banks and we probably had banks before that. But again, the introduction of banks made it easier to move this money around. And then chain, uh, checks made it even easier to pay your employees. And now we have electronic funds transfer and even mobile. But I want you to think back just at a high level, how did that process change with each new wave of technology? You know, every time you introduce some new wave of technology, the process and the order of steps does change. And so anytime there's a new wave of technology coming out, your processes should probably change to really improve the productivity of your organization. It's not just that you get a lot of value out of seeing it, but most likely uh, the technology will enable something new. The other thing we want you to do is under uh, think about how would you measure the productivity of your organization? And we we've, we've look at this for several reasons. In some cases, our clients are looking to justify the cost of replacing a new system, but in other uh, situations, they need to shift uh, the funding model or the shift the way that they're paying. So I'm going to show you an example of a property and casualty pool, and we'll bounce back and forth between the property and casualty example and the health pool. So this particular pool, uh, they had three departments, underwriting, claims, and finance. It was about a 45-person pool, and we mapped a total of almost 50 processes. And then we did something called a waste walk. A waste walk is looking at for every step in the process, what percent of those had waste in them. And so in this case, it was pretty staggering. Uh, this one, the underwriting department was pretty efficient because they had given the best requirements to the vendor, but the claims department had a lot of inefficiency and the poor finance department was kind of downstream of both of those and they received even more inefficiencies. And then we, uh, did a time value of uh, what's the cost of those employees. And so this isn't necessarily the cost of, um, you know, being able to free up those employees and replace them with someone else. This is the idle time of those employees that they're sitting there waiting to do their work and primarily because the technology isn't providing them the features they need. So we're going to walk you through how we did these calculations. In this particular example, again, of the stress pool, we looked at uh, each key process in there. And so you can probably see the level of detail, but you might see we analyzed claims checks or claims intake. And from those, we calculated for all the steps, what percent of those had waste. And you can see some really big numbers. And from that exercise, and this particular one was fed right into a vendor selection, but it became apparent after this that they needed to move from one platform to another. And so we looked at an example of what were the features that were needed. And when you do a platform selection, you typically will create what's called a scoring matrix. And that's what you're seeing here, 10 high-level buckets. And those features are prioritized across the teams. We also scored what the current state was. And so from their waste walks, they identified 150 must-have requirements. And then today, they found that the current vendor was, only, uh, was missing about 100 of them. So a huge gap that they didn't really have visibility into. They knew there were some pain points, but until they did this level of analysis, they didn't really understand how much pain there was. So let's look at the next level down. How do you go about measuring that? So there's really two lens that we want you to, you know, to measure the productivity of your organization. It's really trying to understand what we call you, what your white collars uh, workers are doing. And those two lens are around uh, resource utilization and around process efficiency. So again, resource utilization is how effective are each of your employees and the other one is how fast are your process, is your process throughput? And you actually care more about your process throughput than you do resource utilization. If you have everybody working at 90% utilization, that means you've got bottlenecks everywhere. You really only care about where those bottlenecks are for your processes. So from an organization standpoint, um, let's take a look at how you organize this. So think of it initially at a departmental level. And departments have processes. You have individuals within departments. But processes also have tasks or steps in there. And at the enterprise level, you have multiple departments, and you might have big connected processes. And we see this in pools all the time. If in the property casualty space, a connected process would be how does the policy flow to the claim, and how does that flow then on out to the billing? And how does all that work together? On the health pool side, very similar. You're getting claims from third parties, but you have all of these. Where it gets a little complex is, okay, how efficient are you at each level, and how effective are you? because it gets a little hairy because the department, um, each enterprise has multiple departments, which has multiple individuals, processes are closed in multiple steps, and so it can get kind of hairy. And so you might wonder, why should you even do that? Why would you want to understand all of this complexity? Well, 
if you don't understand this complexity, it makes it very difficult to understand if you're improving your profit margin, or in the case of a risk pool, we call that the service margin. Are you able, with your contributions, are you able to, to provide more and more services without substantially growing your headcount? And ultimately, is your technology working for you or against you? And in many of the cases where we see our clients, when they analyze the processes, they actually are able to see where technology is actually working against them. And it also helps you see what old ways of doing business no longer make sense. We find many processes that were in place because of either old workarounds or a risk that occurred that's been alleviated since then. And ultimately, what are your most expensive resources doing that should be automated? So we're going to walk you quickly through that methodology of what these are. So the first thing is to list what your processes are. You're going to interview your process owners. You'll map those processes. We'll show you an example. We'll do something called a waste walk. We'll touch on why that's important doing some issues, risk, and opportunity analysis, and you may find some short-term versus long-term solutions. That is, you may not be looking for a brand new vendor. You may find a lot of quick wins that you don't need to go through. We also want to caution you, uh, if you skip these steps, what can happen? So if you don't look at all the processes, you may not look at the right opportunities. You're just going to analyze the process for the person that, that is complaining the most. If you don't interview the process owners, you re really understand how technology is being used we hear this all the time in our clients where the IT team is just really shocked to find out how much work is going on outside of the core platforms. What's going on in email? What's going on in Excel? That's uh, because the system does not work. We also see when you map your processes, how consistent processes are being followed. A lot of our clients have standard operating procedures, but people interpret those in very different ways. And so when you see it on a board or in a visualization, it's much easier for people to understand how those processes were. And so this is so I'm just going to interject. This is probably the slide that Philip is on right now, one of the most important slides for you to take away from today, because what he's talking about when your INS team or your reporting and data team doesn't understand what the day-to-day -day activities are happening, when we went through this process mapping, it was amazing the groups that were using the same report, just pieces of it and not utilizing it in total. So the ability to get all levels of your team into a room and spend time really laying out how everyone uses the data without even getting to the RFP or getting to our new system, I would say that we have probably had 10 to 15% improvement in our productivity just by having the conversation because somebody across the table goes, oh, I do that too. Now we just do it once. So I can't, I just didn't want to let go how important this process can be and the efficiencies that you can get immediately. Thank you, Wendy. And so she also touched on uh, looking at issues, risks, and opportunities. So that discussion is uh, identifying where do you need to, what are the right solutions for the problems that you're seeing? As Wendy mentioned, uh, there's a lot of short-term things that you can do uh, that can fix those problems. You don't always have to go out and look for a new platform. And so it really improves that relationship between what we call business and IT. So you may ask, how do you identify what the processes are? Uh, in some cases, you're, you're just come in and survey experts. In the case of Health Trust, they were able to diagram their systems and it was very clear from there, uh, there were some processes that may not have been captured somewhere else. Uh, most of you have standard operating procedures, uh, either to pass an audit or just to onboard your employees. And we've also found there's some industry-specific stuff uh, that are called process classification frameworks. So any of those are great pools of information. Uh, now there's probably enough in AGRIP that you can get a starting laundry list from your peers. And then you want to interview your process owners. So typically someone in the role of what's called a business analyst uh, in some cases, we've done this for our clients, uh, for the health, um, health trust. Two of the health trust business analysts did this work themselves. So they filled up something called a SIPOC. It was basically a document uh, in Word or Excel where you are at looking for some basic attributes to who owns the process, what are the inputs, what are the outputs. And this is a really easy input to start here. And it, it basically allows the process owner to just freeform brain dump what goes on. Then the business analyst goes away and they will come back and they will draw this visually. And there's something called a, a business process management notation. What's most important is being able to uh, draw it in these swim lanes. And swim lanes are different actors, so you can see where there are handoffs between teams. And this is intentionally blurry, so you can't see what it is. Um, 
And then the business analyst is now you play this back and you're gonna see some minor tweaks or changes, but typically this can be done the very next day. Afterwards, we like to do what's called a waste walk. And the reason this waste walk is important is before this point, uh, the process owner really doesn't feel ownership of the process. They still feel that IT or the business analyst owns the process. The waste walk is looking at every step, every one of those boxes, and the process owner is saying, okay, is there any kind of waste here? And this comes from lean manufacturing. And so are there defects here? Am I moving something around? Is there duplicate? Am I over-processing? And within just one or two steps, the business owner is able to identify these. And they're able to envision new solutions in their head very quickly. So it's very beneficial to do this analysis, particularly to have the process owners. They now feel empowered to take ownership of the process going forward. And it's good to kind of pull all of that together and aggregate this. So one of our other clients did this work. Uh, they looked at all of the different types of waste, and they added in another bucket, which is called noncompliance. So they had probably 20%, if not 30% of things they were doing were noncompliant for the industry they were in. And then they found out that of all of those areas of waste and noncompliance, half of those could have been utilized with their existing technology, but somebody turned it off in the past because they tried to automate the process uh, the way it was before, rather than take advantage of the new technology. The other half required a substantially new platform or enhancements. And from there, you can determine what are your long-term enhancements or short-term enhancements. That makes it much easier to create a summary report like this that you can tell to the rest of your staff or your team what percent waste is there across those different areas? And so the example you're seeing here is for a property and casualty one. Wendy's team, uh, their business analyst created a similar one for how many processes was it again, Wendy, that you presented to your board? I think it was over 100 processes. 100 processes they mapped in about three months. It was very, very impressive. And then from there, it becomes apparent, do you, what, what do you need to do for your new um, system versus something you can do in the short term? So some of you may ask the question, you know, why were processes inefficient at Health Trust? So I'm gonna weave together several different artifacts that we discussed to explain that. So after they looked at all of the different process maps, and I'm just showing some examples for group or retiree, uh, some for pot, what they call positive billing, and for some other ones, there were some key, key uh, root causes. And so the root causes were the core platform that was selected over a decade ago was lacking features that were specific for health trust. And again, this was what was best in breed at the time, a decade ago. But that core platform at that time was really designed for, uh, for traditional health insurance carriers. They really didn't understand the nuances and, and specifics of a pool. And we also see this on the property casualty side for some of the legacy platform providers. It also meant that Core Platform, they were built on an older technology and it was very difficult to modify the platform for health trust market's needs. And so you may ask, well, what caused that? What was the impact of that? Well, what happened was over the 10 years, because the risk pool and particularly health trust was very good at uh, designing workarounds, the IT team began to fill the gaps with a lot of custom solutions. So there were a lot of really cool, elegant solutions they built. Uh, but they also were adopted a good practice called Agile, which was how do we make sure our IT team is properly utilized, that they always have a steady amount of work in their backlog. And so they kept prioritizing items that were able to do short term, but it kind of just pushed off the, we need to replace this new system or the analysis of what else is in the market today. And then it wasn't until uh, some discussions uh, in this networking events that what were the new platforms able to do? and it wasn't really apparent until the on-site demos. So let me just show you an example of, this is the drawing that their team created. And so in that little box in the middle is called a core platform. All of these blue boxes around it are custom applications. The orange boxes are other common um, platforms that you need to provide. So you'll see the accounting system is there, your internal payroll. But again, those blue boxes, all of that their IT team had built to close the gaps to integrate to a wellness provider, uh, to do sp a specific portal for uh, different types of members and enrollees. So there were a lot of gaps that they had to fill. And so over time, what they found was that there were just a lot of custom apps, but in the market today, there's at least two or three vendors that are providing the majority of these features, and these are out of the box today. But the business impact to Health Trust was that there was a lot of manual reentry of information across these systems, 
And every one of those arrows, not all of those were automated. Some of those were integrations, but some were people rekeying information. And so if there was a break in that integration, there was some manual exceptions. So not only do those arrows exist, a lot of times those arrows represent people that need to handle exceptions for a platform that's not tightly integrated. And what was really concerning, particularly to the board, was that there was a lot of data entry that could propagate and that would directly impact the members. So Wendy, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, to that? Any other conversations that the board have when you presented to them your findings and recommendations? Because you didn't show them all the analysis that you did, just the key stuff that was relevant for why you were shopping for a new platform. We did, and I think one of the conversations that is gonna be continuing on as we go through this process is we didn't enter this process with the thought of we want to come out with less staff and be more efficient on the other end. We really want to be able to find ways to leverage the staff that we have in ways that they're not doing repetitive manual tasks that can be done automatically. Because with all of our organizations and our pools no different, our members keep wanting new services. You know, we used to get all calls. Now we get calls and emails. Soon we want secure text messaging. That all takes resources to manage and handle. And as we add new programs, we wanna be able to leverage and not do manually those things that have been done. But I think that's a delicate conversation when you have an elected board who's spending public dollars to enhance a system that could be expensive to be able to get them to see that you may have the same amount of staff at the same time to allow that future growth. All right. So I'm going to transition to explaining why are these modern vendors able to provide all of this functionality. And so I want to kind of compare and contrast uh, what's uh, unique about these new what are called cloud-first software providers. So over time, um, there are features that are released by the vendors, and that's they're trying to determine what's the market going to want feature-wise. When we had on-premise software, and this has been the case since uh, the 80s, I would say the early 80s, uh, one vendor, vendors typically do what's called a three-year release cycle. With cloud first, there's really one single code base, and most of these vendors are designed around releasing features every six weeks. So just by uh, sheer velocity, those there will be a feature gap that the one that's able to launch features every six weeks is much more able to quickly get them to the market, find out what reflects demand. So I wanna show you what goes on behind the scenes, particularly with an IT department, and what goes on between the vendor and a traditional IT department uh, for an on-premise. So in an on-premise one, uh, you have a product team that is, uh, they launched their old version, so the product team is now designing their new one. It takes about nine months or so, that design is locked in. And then it takes them about a year or so to design all those features, and they build it and they test it, and then they launch it, and after a three-year window. Well, from the customer perspective, they're going to regression test that. Well, the reason they regression tested it is because they had access to the code in their environment. They made a lot of customizations and workarounds. And so they never take that first release. They wait for patches because you've customized it. And so then the vendor has customized it and you don't really launch that feature until sometimes, and we see this typically four years later, whatever you finally launched four years later was on the drawing board uh, four years ago. So, over time, this uh, causes a big gap. And so the idea is, even if vendor one is really entrenched in the market, they may have a lot of features in front of that cloud provider, but that cloud provider is able to catch up and overtake them very, very quickly. We've seen that in almost every industry that we've seen, whether it's in the health pools or it's in um, the risk pools or even in traditional insurance providers. Uh, the traditional insurance companies are struggling even more so because they don't really have a key cloud player in their space for those really big players. So you get that gap that the cloud vendor, because they only have one single code base, they're gonna launch the same features months to years faster, but they're also gonna launch new features months to year faster. So I just want you to understand mechanically behind the scenes, this is a major, major shift, and that's why uh, the vendors that are cloud first are able to provide the bulk of those uh, blue boxes that we showed you at Health Plan and they can quickly roll out new features in just a few months. So the concept uh, overall is what we call service amplification. So we talked a lot about analyzing how much does your current technology cost today? How much time is it, are you spending with your staff? Your goal is really how much can you lower your operating costs through re-engineering or automation 
or perhaps outsourcing to third parties, but increasing your service. So expanding that reach, uh, if you want to grow your pool, some of you are in that, in that mode. Others want to just look at rolling out new services. How quickly can you add a new financial product or a new insurance product into your market? Or how well do you want to retain those customers and provide higher tech service and also providing self-service? So that's the overall framework, uh, you know, the concept. How do you do that? Well, we like to recommend something called tiered service delivery. And so the idea is really organizing all of your processes and your technology and your people around this kind of four-tiered approach. And you've, many of you have seen this before, but tier zero is that self-service model. So the idea is typically a member or an enrollee. Uh, in the case of a health pool, that might actually be an, a city employee or a family member. They're able to do a self-service transaction. In tier one, maybe a call to a shared service center or a call center or a help desk. Uh, tier two would be that an external, um, that internal resource. So it might be this goes to claims, this goes to policy, or in the case of a health plan, it's going to go to a specific product if they're an expert in the health plan versus the dental plan versus the vision plan. And then tier three is who is that expert either inside the company or outside the company. And by number of requests coming in, we like to see uh, more of this kind of distribution. And it's not necessarily saying push everybody to self-service, but it allows for certain personas and certain people to go self-service if they don't want to talk to a human being, but it also allows them just to be more efficient and more effective. But it does require integrated tools and an integrated database. We saw, for example, at, at Health Trust that um, they were having to log into all of those different systems. So the CR, the customer support team, may potentially be logging into over 15 different applications to answer a call coming in versus a new system would have all that there. And that makes it much easier to have that consistency across the tiers. If you uh, get somebody coming in through a website, hand it off to a team and hand it off to a third team, you want that consistency. If you don't have that integrated model, what we typically see is more of this distribution where you have very few people taking advantage of the free offerings that you have or hitting your tier one, and it ties up most of your tier two people and they're two to five times the cost or your tier three. So that really means to your business, your most expensive people are doing work that should be automated or delegated. The other thing we've seen with a lot of pools is that a lot of the senior people have all that knowledge in their head and they walk out the door and it's very hard because they haven't trained their staff for that. And ultimately it impacts your members and it impacts your, uh, your customers because they can't find and consume the services they need. So, Wendy, any, any uh, thoughts on that model around how your team is kind of gravitating toward this model today? I think this is really important. So, we did have the perfect storm. So, if you had met me a year ago and I was sitting here talking to you, I would have had over 15 years experience in our call center. Um, today, sitting here, I have less than two years um, experience in our call center. So, we experienced almost 100% turnover due to retirements. And so, this ability to simplify and know where to get the information to talk to our members was critical to our staff and that was a lot of the impetus um, for this um, going forward and looking at how we service our members. We also, as many of you, have public sector employees, so we have people who are on third shift work, school teachers who it's becoming harder and harder to have time during the day to call your normal call center that's open 8.30 to 4.30, really looking for that self-tier option. So this really resonated with us, and this is what we started having the dialogue with our staff to try to make it about making sure they were doing valuable work for themselves, but also to meet the members' needs. So as we close out, uh, we wanted to have you have a few takeaways. And one is the importance of mapping your processes and to really look at what's in the market for the modern tools that can help you serve your member needs. If you're going to look at a new platform, um, as, as Wendy mentioned, it's really important to see and document what you have today and really understand where the waste and inefficiencies in those processes, because it's much easier to bring your staff along to understand and get excited about uh, where the automation opportunities are to also get them excited about the new types of support roles they're going to have to take on because those people will probably not go away. They'll have to take on new types of uh, support. So if, you, if you're stuck with your older technologies, what we typically will see is that your smaller members uh, will probably switch to more savvy startups. Uh, and that can be ones that can quote and onboard you much faster. 
or uh, the larger members, the ones that are probably your good customers, they may leave you because they you can't prove that you mitigate risks better than anyone else. The other thing we see, you get into a spiral where you're, it's hard to attract and retain the talent that's needed to speed up those internal operations, improve the relationship with your members, and really start moving the leaders to being able to make decisions based on data rather than instincts. And then it then causes that longer spiral that you're probably gonna make even bigger mistakes trying to catch up. So we have about four minutes left here for uh, questions uh, that we could open up. Uh, but if you do have any questions that you're afraid to ask in front of the larger audience, feel free to email or phone Wendy or myself with any of those questions. Philip and Wendy, we do have a number of questions that have come in through the um, question box. And for other folks, as we go through these questions, please do also enter yours. Um, this is a question for both of you, but why don't we start with you, Wendy? Can you, you guys both talked early on about the waste walks. And can you talk a little bit more, Wendy, from your pool's perspective about some of the explicit points of waste that you found? And then Philip, if you talk about that a little bit more generally in the terms of all types of pools. So what specific sort of items of waste did um, Wendy's pool identify? And what do you see generally as some of those explicit um, points of waste? Sure, and you know, for me as a pool administrator, um, when we talk about waste or inefficiencies, boy, I still, the hair on my arm stands up when we use that because it's not that staff was doing something wrong or we weren't you know, being trying to be efficient, but we just got in our own way. So some of those examples for me is that we um, would put out on our website a form, a PDF fillable form that you could fill out. So as a member, they felt like they were doing an online application or an address change form. But what would actually happen is it would come into our offices, we would print it out, someone would sit and key that into the system. And so that's waste in the system. So you think you're taking the next step in, in, in improving your processes, but now we've been able to put a different lens on and see, no, we need to be able to fill it in a form that then can use some automated technologies and put it right into our processes system. So someone's not then keying that information. That's one example. Another example is where we would uh, we run what's called pre-EDI reports. So before we send over our 834 files, we run a bunch of reports. And each of those reports has to be opened to see if there's errors on them versus adding some technology around that process, at least initially, that will allow us just a dashboard that says, out of the 50 reports you ran, here's the three that have errors, go look at those. Now that's the interim step in our full solution. We hope that you can't actually key into the system with an error that it stops you at the point of entry and we stop running pre-EDI reports altogether. So those are a couple examples. And I'll weigh in. One of the common areas of waste that we see is anytime you have a repeatable Excel document that somebody's going in and touching an Excel document every day, week, month, or year, because they're probably pulling information to run a report to present it to someone else, or they're pulling data out to do some analysis, or in the worst case, they're using Excel to manage a work queue to know these are the items I need to work off of. That's your biggest sign that there's a lot of waste going on because your system isn't doing what it needs to do. What's a little harder to do is to really track all of your emails in and out that have attachments or the email coming in causes a person inside to look up something and then send it back to a different channel. And so a lot of it's hard for a lot of our pools to really get visibility into that unless they have a good good call center and good call tracking where they're putting those kind of call notes though. Uh, but those are the typical hunting ground that we see is that your you, Excel is one of the biggest workarounds and I would say Outlook is your second biggest workaround where you see a lot of waste where you're moving stuff around or reproducing something. And then I guess the last one is rekeying. We call it key whacking, where you're taking information from one to another and a person is retyping it in or copying and pasting it. And again, that's really only found in a waste walk or observing that. And that, that may come out in some of the early drawings, but it's really when you do the waste walk, the customer, um, I mean, sorry, that the process owner will explain back to you and understand how uh, inefficient that is and that there's other ways to do things. What's another question, Stephanie? 
Yep. So um, another question is building off the waste walk. And we actually have um, several questions in the queue and I want to make sure we get to them and we can go up until um, the top of the hour. But the next question really builds off that waste walk. And Wendy, this is more um, for you. You had talked a little bit about the idea of going through the waste walk and how one of the goals is to um, raise the level of work the employees are doing to better serve your members. And the attendee was wondering, what was it like to get your employees on board to overcome, you know, how did you overcome any concerns that their jobs were going to be eliminated and what is their job satisfaction like now? And also, what have you been hearing back from your members since you've been starting these processes? That's a great question. So the conversations with staff were very interesting because I think there was a lot of hesitation at first on their part about what does this mean? Are we gonna put ourselves out of a job? If I really say how long it takes me to do that, what's gonna happen? And then what we did is we found a couple of champions within our operations team that got really excited about it and took a couple processes and started putting it out. And literally, if you walked around our building now, it looks like wallpaper everywhere on the building. And so my, my key point to you would be find a couple of champions that can then raise that comfort level within the team that this is okay, because if we do this, look, we're gonna get this new shiny technology over here. We're gonna be able to offer this service and be more effective. So it was finding that champion. But I'll be honest that we've gone up and down in that process. So it's not all roses. Um, and so you do have to have a lot of individual conversations with team members. We're doing a lot more reporting on um, metrics now. How many pieces of paperwork did you key? But now the questions we're asking is, it's not, oh, why did you just key that many? It's what got in the way of keying more? What else did you do? What's not in your job description that somebody comes and hacks you to do every day? So it's building that culture over time. And I think we're finally got to a point where people feel very comfortable with the process. And for us, it's been pretty much an internal process right now. So the members haven't seen a lot of this yet. I suspect that much of what we're doing right now will be more visible to the members over the next year. And, and Wendy, can you also share with us um, the role of your board in this process? Um, how were they engaged, if at all, or was this strictly a, a staff level project? So absolutely, our, our board stays at a policy level. So we have been educating the board and really finding out where their strategic initiatives lie for the organization. And so we have done a lot of work. We have a two-day strategic retreat every year. We spend a lot of time on the high-level technology pieces. They are not down in the weeds with us, but we will uh, be presenting to them again in December. Um, there's a large cost to new systems. And so it will be incumbent upon my team between now and December really to help the board see for the cost what the value adds will be and of course, there is always the potential that there may be some staff adjustments. So you may not need as many staff processing paperwork, but you need more staff that are member facing to do new um, different initiatives. And so we're going through that balance right now and we'll make that presentation, but our board is more at the policy level. Okay, great. Well, um, now we're, we've got a couple of more questions here. So. Um, the next question comes from one of our attendees who shares that they're the administrator of a small health and welfare pool. They have seven members that are public employers and they um, provide services to 1500 employees and a total of 4700 covered individuals. The pool doesn't currently have an online platform for their employees or member employers. So the attendee is wondering what types of recommendations Wendy and Philip, you might have to start the process of implementing a data platform. The attendee is wondering if there's a sweet spot at which an implementation of a cloud-based platform is cost effective. I can oh, speak yeah, to that. Well, so, <laughs> yeah, one of the one aspect of, of it being cost effective, and I think this is this was a challenge, I would say, for for Health Trust and others. Mm -hmm. The model, the financial model before was uh, you spend money in an on-premise vendor, you're paying that particular vendor 
certain amount of money every year. And then you're, you have a team building enhancements, but the model going forward for these cloud providers is a very different financial model. It's typically around uh, several you know dollars per employee that's being covered. So it doesn't include the family. So you really need to see what is, what is your cost today to manage all of that. And um, what's harder to calculate is to also estimate what is the time waste or savings to the actual um, employee that's insured or the manager of uh, whether there's seven or eight there. So there's multiple areas for time savings that you can calculate to help justify that cost, but also to help you see that the vendors are not all the same price. There's a substantial difference in price between some of them. And so you want to know, is it worth that extra cost or not? So there's multiple areas, what I call hunting ground for looking for that cost justification for doing that. But the cloud providers are designed to scale in a way to go down fairly small because they try to bait, price it based on how many uh, employees you have versus you need a minimum price to step in and play the game. Um, the next question, and um, I, I just asked the questioner for a little bit more context, but you guys might be able to work through this one. Um, the attendee is asking how you selected your knowledge sharing peer. And I <laughs> flipping through the slide deck to find the reference to that and haven't succeeded. So I'm wondering if you can provide any insight on that question. Sure. Uh, so it comes from, I've been with our organization for 30 years. So when I first came on to our organization, I was looking for peers around the country that had similar um, organizational structures as us. And at the time, for me, it was two pools that are in the western part of the state. So Association of Washington Cities and the Oregon pool had similar. But for people that are listening in the audience or participating in the webinar, I think the most important thing you can do is attend the trainings through AGRIP and other associations of organizations like us throughout the country, because that's really where I develop those relationships and you want start to understand what strategies they're employing, what their boards are like. And those conversations over my tenure here have been the most important thing to figuring out what we should be looking at, how are other people doing things, and avoiding, quite frankly, the pitfalls that the person who went first did, you can learn from them. So those relationships and um, utilizing groups like AGRIP to get that support system. And I would just add, I would highly encourage you to spend not just like an hour or two at an AGRIP conference, but build a network, build a relationship there, and then invite them to come to a good location at a good time of year and spend a day where you can just uh, pump, the, you know, pull as much information as you can out of them. So it was at a very picturesque location in New Hampshire where they had this in the summertime. It was a great time and location. And so there was probably a bit of um, bribery there to, to get them to come across the country. But that one day is very valuable where you don't have any distractions from work and you can share all of your best practices. So you know, build those relationships at AGRIP and find those people that are willing to share their, their um, pains and lessons learned with you. So we've got a couple more minutes for a couple more questions. And one more has come in, Wendy and Philip, since um, posing the last one. And I'll, I'll do another push to our attendees to please share any questions that you have. We've got a few minutes. Um, but the next question really centers around um, what I would call or frame based on the asker's questions, long-term uh, technology finance planning. Wendy and Philip, um, Wendy, you've gone through a lot of changes at your pool um, related to technology, and you're looking at a pretty long horizon to continue this work. How has your pool um, adjusted, if at all, or readjusted the way it thinks about financing its technology? And Philip, what are you seeing in the industry as um, pools look, look to update legacy systems? Um, we look at how integral technology is to everything we do now. How do people plan for these expenditures, um, short term and long term? So this was one of the major conversations at our board retreat um, last month was a financing plan for a very large investment. 
And so the board has directed staff to go out and look at if there's a similar for, a, you know, as you would a capital improvement um, policy or plan for your infrastructure, your building, can we create one of those for our IT system? How can we finance it so there's not a huge jump in member contribution rates, but we spread that over time. Part of that with the cloud solutions that helps is we're finding at least on the RFPs that we've done so far, the large investments have shrunk, but the PEPMs or PMPMs, however your pricing looks, have become more of the model, which helps you balance that over time. So we're just in the throes of that, and it's a great question and something we'll be wrestling with over the next few months. Yeah, this is a slide that uh, we shared at the St. Louis event, I believe. But in the past with on-premise, there was this kind of model. Uh, you would make an investment, and then over a series of years, you would rebuild that platform. And so the thought was you would have an initial project and then you would typically set aside 20% of um, not just your, your licensing, but also the labor that was involved in doing that. The model that we're moving towards more with the cloud is either, it's more of a dedicated team. And so those costs are spread out over time. And so you're gonna continually fund that, but we also uh, recommend having a team that's very quickly iterating and applying new features that come from your cloud provider. And so we do see this more on the, uh, on your website, maybe if you have a learning management platform, that's more in that space. What we don't like to see is this model where you, it's called a launch it and leave it, where you spend the money up front and you never maintain it, uh, realizing it is an expensive asset, and you spend some money trying to catch up, and then you spend even more, and we call that the underinvestment penalty. So we're seeing people not really do one or two or understand that, but really start preparing the board towards that option two model. When you go to that option two model, you really need to have a better sense of how much more effective are you making your staff and your members. And so that's why we emphasize that um, uh, service amplification concept because ultimately it gets down to budget and you probably need to explain it as simply as this to your board members. Well, Wendy and Philip, thank you so much. Um, we don't have any other questions from attendees. So what I'd like to do is uh, thank both of you for sharing your insight and advice and helping pools think about the importance of waste walks, providing some examples of what waste walks look like, um, whether it's touching the same data too many times, um, creating ways that it looks like a member's filling out a form that might go into your database, but really what's happening on the pool side is you're printing off a piece of paper and then keying it into your data system um, and helping us think about how we can decode the cost of our tech systems. To our attendees, thank you so much for giving us your time today and thank you for your really great questions. Um, as we mentioned before, we are recording this and so we'll make the recording available to you through the AGRIP website in the coming days and we'll also post a copy of the slides to that posting so that you have those there. Um, with that, thank you everyone and have a lovely remainder of the day.